our spot. You, you can see it. And uh, it's our spot. I have, you can be seated for those dolls. You can be seated. Unless you, unless, unless you want to stand. No, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Thank you, Jesse. Can I lose Brother Jake? Ah. Pastor Jake, I'm going to get over to the dolls on the platform from here. Thank you, sir. They have a stranger at our house. How many of you do dishes at your house? Is your hand? How many of you believe it? How many of you use a paper plates? All of them. Come on. But what about the, the Green New Deal? Hey, in my house, it's like paper plates are in. And um, same thing with making the bed. Let's make the bed in the morning. Let's not. Why not? Because we're going to get right back in at 6 o'clock. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mr. Jackson doesn't agree with my philosophy, though. But uh, we have a strainer to do the dishes. When I was a kid, we had a drive. Well, we had to put it in the strainer. So I was putting the dishes away. I do a lot of that stuff, wash dishes. I'm cooking now. Because, man, I haven't been able to do this while I was not cooking. I cook some soup. Oh, yeah. And uh, I noticed the strainer. I noticed the strainer. They got the microwaves, right? And uh, I, noticed, I looked in the strainer, and there was like a film. It wasn't a film, it was like gross. And I had to take this drainer, but it's got the strainer that sits on the end of the water drains and then it goes into your sink, it's supposed to do it. So I took it all apart. There was this one little snap on the Walmart special. Man, I think it's that thing was gross. And I, of course, your brain works sometimes. And it said, Doug, the grossness in that is the water that comes out right there. And so the water that comes out right there, is the water right here. Oh, no. <laughs> I had a friend who called the toilet paper tea. He would make a tea call. <laughs> I'm a preacher. I'm just showing you, man, you can drink it and not die. But our house, we use a Brita filter. You know, I'm not drinking that, man. I, I don't even put that stuff on my garden, you know. I mean, oh, another thing. Ms. Jackson did gardening, soloing yesterday, knocking on the door. You wouldn't, you wouldn't believe it, but I met a guy about 6'5", 300 pounds, blonde hair, named Noah, he's just like me. He won't shut up. <laughs> we were around, uh, you guys got a food harvest? Anyway, we went to his backyard. All these plants, he's got tomatoes, Miss Jennifer. Big old and man, that's my favorite. Yes, yeah, any of my kids, I can eat tomatoes for breakfast on the so <laughs> If they're right, um, these are, you know, they're hard as apples. You buy, you know, yeah. hot apples, but you slice them um, with salt, pepper, and slice them. Come on. Anyway, our friend Noah at our last door, nine doors yesterday, for an hour, let say, um, he's going to turn me on all this stuff. And then I don't know how it came up. My boy's like, I don't want to bring that part about packing heat. You got to look it up. I can't remember where I go. Told some interesting stories. <laughs> this week, you can't even tell the church about people shooting themselves at the bad places. It's <laughs> crazy. This is a crazy story. But the reason I, I tell that is because of the water. Talking about the water. Talking about uh, we were singing and Jake was talking about, you know, sometimes things are tough and just keep going. And you can't let. Like Miss Jackson, she won't bring, if it's not a lot of water, she won't touch it. I mean, she wears gloves and do dishes. That's how so much she hates the water. It's not great. And so, just can't that for Brother Jake or myself. I'll need mine later. Jake will probably pour this out from my garden. All right, so for uh, for the offering that I have, a missionary, mention that quickly. I was going to bring the checkbook. I need to do a monthly, I don't know if there's some type of uh, report. I'm just going to read it. Here's, you know, read it to you. Utility bills, sword of the Lord, no off supply, Pastor Jake, um, a million, not a million, but and then show you. But here's here's the thing I want to say as far as offering. Um, the church pays every bill it has. We don't pay bills late. We don't balance checks. We don't give our word and break it. Twenty seven years, however long we've been here. Um, I have a checkbook, our church checkbook is reached, it's almost to 10,000, the check number 10,000. The only person I ever saw do that was Dr. Harrington, sure check one time, was like offering or something. It was in the 10,000s, it's like, bro, in her case, bro, Ed. You know, you've been to bro, bro, lean. You've been to, and I, I'm, I'm anxious for our church to get to where 
or something, and I try to keep every year the same register so it was ever, you know, I go right back to the register. By the way, if you tithe, give offerings, use an envelope. Envelopes are in the back. Write your name, date, whatever, come out. And then if you want to, if you need to, we, we, we keep every envelope regardless. And then your taxes. At the end of the year, you do taxes. So you make, you know, if you make 50 grand, then and you tithe five grand, you knock that right off your taxes. It's tax deductible. It seems to be our uh, uh, charitable, not a profit organization. So those things are there for you. I hope you will use them. Whether the government gives us a break or not, I don't give a rip. Bob says do, you know, do right. And I'm going to do right regardless of Trump, Biden, Bush, Clinton. You know, I, I was born when Eisenhower was the president. Um, and I'll die whenever, whoever. Uh, but with the government, would you say Truman? You don't want to be <laughs> Are you saying Miss Julie, she was born in Lincoln? So, so you said it, not me. My fingerprints are not on this mess. Um, it's been on a few messes before, but I'm hands up. I'm on uh, so, it. So, so you don't have to, I'm going to ask B. Jones, give with the church to go under. A, the church not going under. The church is not going to go under. Why? Because give me a check. No. 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 She says, now give me money from the church. No. I'm like, you can't have this. Like, okay, then no bulletins. All right, how much? It's like I'm a miser, man, when it comes to the church. So you be generous and you can, I gotta get paperwork generated for you, but uh, uh, you be generous and do right. Let, let's let's, uh, let's uh, listen as I give you our, our missionary. Watch this. Uh, this is the land needs. I pray about what missionary to give you. We've already talked about um, the Maluchis, who are in the midst of uh, uh, trying to start a new church in a place where people don't get saved much, Muslims. We talked about uh, the Smith family, where Rhoda Smith, uh, I know him, and Robert Smith here, the husband, and uh, she went and got beat up for soul winning, uh, beat up by Muslims, where she was at Barbados, but she went back, led a, a grandmother to the Lord, brought a grandson, who now 10 years later is a pastor in the ministry. Okay. So you just never know um, uh, what you're doing when you're being obedient. Uh, we talked about Eddie Guy, a good friend of mine, a good friend of this church, did so much uh, while he was here uh, for us. He, he will not be forgotten. We said, well, Eddie Guy, hey, you might as well not say anything bad about Eddie Guy to me because I know all of Eddie Guy's flaws. He, he was one of my best friends for years. We served together yeah, for 15 years. He served with me five years, four years in Ohio's Anderson in Chicago, and then several years here, six or seven years. Eddie Guy was a good friend of this church. Um, uh, so, Eddie Gallia, the Blue Cheese, uh, and then of course, uh, uh, Jack Bachman, who's the son of uh, James Bachman, a good friend of us, mine, our church, Pastor Rowan, for many years, has a stage four cancer. We saw him at Debbie Miller's funeral. Uh, we hung each other and talked and laughed a little bit, but that's his son. The guy was like, I think, literally enough to have 15 children. And he will be back in this neighborhood, so to speak, America, and we'll hear from him. I think uh, Alex was like, uh, found him on Facebook, not found him on Facebook, but some information I've read or whatever. And uh, he's like, oh, this guy's going to get this guy. We should get this guy. Alex, you know what you call him? I said, uh, ask Pastor Jake. <coughs> ask Pastor Jake. Brother Jake wants him. I want him. Brother Jake doesn't want him. I don't want him. And I don't have to know why he wants somebody or doesn't want somebody. He wants uh, whoever, then I want whoever. If he doesn't want him, I don't want him. And it's just that simple. So so the missionary that we support sent him around $500, I think, two weeks ago, four fifty five is what it was. Uh, JD, he's been in our church. He's Filipino missionaries to Cambodia. And I just want to take my reading glasses. I don't want you to forget our missionary. Right. We're not wasting time here. It's not really Jackson. We're talking here, so talk. Don't forget our missionaries, the Luchis. Be beat up. A woman beat up. Now, do you know what my response would be if somebody beat up my wife? I would, well, my response would be different. Without getting into it. Suffice to say, I would be in a rage and I would be arrested because I'd beat that throw that somebody. Their heads in. I 
I'd smack, I'd literally, I literally, I work somebody badly if they beat up my wife. So I'm not as wise as my wife then. Because my wife, not my wife, but Mrs. Smith, what was her name? Rhoda. Picked herself up, cleaned herself off, went home, wept, prayed, cried, I guess, went back the next week. Yeah. Boy, that's that's somebody we ought to think about and pray for occasionally. Things were the Smith and the Smith family. So don't, don't forget these people. Uh, there are missionaries. This is not something we do at church. It's something, it's something that we, we should think about. Uh, let me see if I can read. The Lamb, Dean, and family. There's uh, Joseph, Paula, Jude, Joseph Jr., Paulina, Paulina, Pauline. Uh, let's see, wife's name is N O I M P. What was JD's wife's name? Come on. Yes, can't pronounce it either. All right. Um, sending church out of the Philippines, the city of uh, Tagmao, that's where he's at, is the capital and largest city of Kandao province in central Cambodia. Kandao is a population of 2 million people and is subdivided into 11 districts, which are also, and those districts are subdivided into 146 communities and 100, no, 1,087 villages. He's gonna try and reach them all. Wow. Wow. Is he gonna reach them all? No. Is he gonna try? Yes. yes. He's our guy. We said we'd support him. We told him we loved him. We said we'd pray for him. His name is J.D. Land Dingham. Kind of Land, L-A-N. Ding, like ding dong, D I N G. Go then ding. When they're back, we'd like to hear from them again. Surrounded by communists, dangerous communists, carried weapons. He said nothing. They walked down the street, some of our missionaries, and there's just hostile people with AK 47s. Man, I'm glad I'm here in Fort Wayne compared to yeah. Pray for them. How do they survive? Prayer. Their wits. Love for people. And these are serious people that leave America, the comforts, the actual luxuries we have here, their friends, their family. Of course, it's, you know, it's better now, communications across the ocean and, and whatnot. But not too long ago, it was just letters and phone calls. You think about our missionaries and you pray for them. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for your blessings on us. Daily loaded us with big fits is the fact we can get out of bed and walk and move. It's good to see Brother Mark back there. He's a good guy. No problem with his feet and his here. All the faithful people here. Good to see them. Drew, Nishin, and Kang, and each person in comes. I pray you bless the offering. Bless our missionaries. Lord, I, I have no idea what time it is in Cambodia, but you do. I don't know what time it is in the Philippines, but you do, or Nigeria, but you do. And I, I know, I'm not even gonna pray and ask you to keep your eye on these men and their families because we know you do. But we wanna have a part of it, so we will ask. We, we do care. We do want safety and protection, power and love. Shed on our missionaries. Give them the grace and the strength and the, the need that what they what they need to keep going. That's our offer now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to the book of <clears throat> Numbers, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, the fourth book of the Bible. I am so, you know, I want to sing Bob Seger. I'm not a number. I used to do that all the time. Some phrase would come up and some, and I would, I would do it and 
and I like to do it. It gives me, you know, I like doing it. But um, since we're live Facebook, you need to be watch out. You know, we went from politically correct, watch out, you got to be politically correct, to, to hate speech. I mean, a nanosecond. You know, I, I used a term a few weeks ago, a, a street term, a derogatory term for, now here's the Bible term, sodomite. I use the word fag. I won't use it anymore simply because I don't want some fool from the city coming and telling me I can't say it. It's a street term. It's derogatory. Uh, when I grew up, when I was a kid, that was one of the worst things possible to be, if you were a man, to be a homo. Well, now it's, it's proliferated our nation. A bunch of you sitting out here think, bet you think it's okay. You work with them. You got bosses. You got friends. You have family. Hey, I, I, love, I love my brother, Tony, who was a homo for 20 years. How do you like them apples? We didn't know that. If we'd have known that, oh, you would have been a hypocrite. And he's a good man. He's a good guy. Yeah. And he broke the chains, and he broke free, and he battled his way out of a pit of hell. Uh, and he taught Sunday school here, and he won souls here. When he left, he got taken to the Who's Gal. Um, he, he left behind a, like, I don't know how I got it, but it's a brown belt. And I wear that belt to go soul winning, Alex. I don't make a big deal, but when I put that belt on, it's my brother. He's sitting in Oregon. He'll die. He's going to die in prison. Um, but I love the guy. Well, he was a home over 20 years. I mean, that's who I went to that. I tell you, I want to go to that gay bar. Well, that's who I went with, my brother. Um, of course, I left because they liked me. About 12 men wanted to buy me a drink. I was like, yo, this ain't the West, and we ain't in the saloon, and I'm out of here. I'm not going out the back door either where I get mugged. I'm going out the front door where there's other people that can because I was just a kid, man. The cops raided it. You had to be 21. I think I was 20. I wasn't quite 21. I'm like, oh, no. I'm going to get caught up in a dragnet of a homo bar. Oh, no, no. Praise the Lord. Somehow they didn't, they didn't bust me. I'm like, oh, Jesus, I'll never do this again. And I haven't. I haven't yet. yet. You got the yet? <laughs> and so, so here's the thing. It turns into hate speech, th those words. I won't use them. Well, people are offended. Now, whether people are offended or not, is not my primary objective. Primary objective. I do want to be careful not to offend. But if you remember when I was using that term, it was in reference to the, watch out, Jackson. It was in reference to the wolves, vipers, asps, snakes at the downtown churches. For, for people from this church who are born again now will never spend eternity in hell. They're going to heaven. Why? Well, because they heard the gospel. And they didn't hear the gospel at the churches they went to for years and years and years. And the, after I said that, and I, I, was, I said it in anger. Oh, you were angry? Yeah, I was angry. I get angry a lot and plan on keep on. I'm not, I like me. I told my grandsons yesterday when they were unloading the truck, I said, boys, I'll jump down. I'll pop your heads off your neck if you don't listen to me. And dad was standing right there. Now, I don't take over dad's duties, but I'm like, hey, you better, you better do what I told you the first time, not make you talk to you. Like, oh. And then I tell them, look, I'm not mad. You're not mad. No, I'm not mad. I'm getting your attention. We're going to do this job right. You're going to learn to do it. And when a 10-year-old boy, like, Houston, or 12-year-old boy like Lucas, little horses, little, little stocky Clydesdale, they're as uncoordinated as I'll get out, but look, they play basketball like, like they're, okay, so you'll learn, don't get mad, and so, um, uh, but they're hard workers, they're, them boys are little men, well, if you're going to teach them to work when they're little, you say, it's okay, Junior, no, it's not, do the job right, if you're not going to do the job right, don't do the job, well, they're only children, 
Tomorrow they'll be teenagers, and the day after that be adults. And then dads and fathers need to work for 40 years to support their family. Bummer for you. You got to work like 45 or 50 years to support your wife and kids. Here's my advice. Don't get lazy. All right, you thought I was going to marry. <laughs> and so if I use terms, listen now, if I use terms, if I have used terms, I'm going to watch out for myself. It's, uh, you don't want to, though, because as a pastor, as a preacher of the Word of God, to people of the Word of God, you don't want to be um, uh, hindered or, or bridled by a fear that you're going to say, the words you say or the truth you give in the spirit in which you give it can be um, uh, held up objectively. And it, listen, it's coming to America. It won't be long. Um, J. Frank Norris told his students the two most important things you can learn, history and English. History so you know what's happened. you, you got to know your history. And if you don't know your history, that's okay. I know some history. He knows some history. And we'll preach it and teach it. But the important thing for a preacher is to preach the word of God to his people without being bridled. Uh, the terms I use, I don't think I'm going to use the word. Watch, I'll say it again. Is it on Facebook? Fag. There, that's on Facebook. <gasps> I don't use, I got a bunch of other street terms too. Do you ever use slang? I got all kinds of street terms for different things. I bet you do too. Do, are, you, are you afraid? I'm afraid to say that. Well, I am not afraid. And you don't want preachers that are afraid. But you want them that are wise. You don't want to come here and just have guys rant. You want to hear truth, and that's important. And last I preached one time, I went way over, and I, the, I was, I embarrassed myself. For me, oh no, that's the greatest sermon we ever heard. Well, it wasn't the best one I ever preached. And so I promised you, when I say, you know, when I say I'll be done at a certain time, mark it down. When I say I'm closing, I'll close. <laughs> and we're going we're gonna to learn a little bit of Bible today. I think you're going to leave the church. You're gonna be, that was a good service and a good day. All right, Numbers chapter 16, verse number <clears throat> 9. I love this scripture. I have it written down on a 3 by 5 card and a picture of me and uh, Rob and Alan Smith together. He's my main man from years and years ago. Um, and uh, I love this scripture. I've never preached from it in all my life, but I've, I've read it many, 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 many times. And uh, Numbers chapter 16, verse number 9. And the Bible says, now again, realize that I stumbled because of my eyesight. I need to get some uh, better glasses. I have it pretty much memorized. Here's what it says. Seemeth it a small thing, seemeth it but a small thing unto you, that the God of Israel hath separated you from his congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation and to minister unto them. All right, look up here real quick. That's what God in the Bible was saying to his the Levites. There were 12 sons of Jacob. One of the sons, Le, Levi, became the, the, the uh, they call them priests, but the, the preacher family, the Levites. And he spoke to the Levites and said, seemeth seem but a small thing unto you that you've been separated from the congregation of Israel. God took you out of the congregation or took you out of the, the group to stand before the congregation. What's it say? To stand before the congregation and to minister unto them. Well, that's his charge from the Bible. Now, I've read that many times and said, Dad, gone, man. Hmm. It's not a small thing. It's a huge thing. And it's a huge thing to any uh, man of God. So with that in mind, um, let's go together where the Bible takes us. Now, this old book, right here, this old book right here that I hold are the words of God. 
It cannot, this old book cannot be improved on. Uh, this old book, which we've had, and, and we've had it for centuries, but we have this book, and it teaches us, Christians in general, and TRBC in particular, how to treat people, how to develop relationships, and how to keep those relationships strong. God gives us relationships for a purpose, for a reason. And we have a pastor for a reason. So number one, this old book, the words of God can't be improved on. Number two, this old book, which teaches us, Christians in general, TRBC in particular, how to treat and uh, our relationships and how to de develop our relationships. Now, I know we agree to that. Number three, we, TRBC, decided unanimously, uh, if I could add that, uh, to ask uh, Brother Jake or Pastor Jake, however you address him, uh, three years and three months ago, 39 months ago, uh, to be our uh, pastor. Now, um, and by the way, that relationship uh, with your pastor, it can be and should be a very good relationship. You know, I, I treasure uh, my many um, pastor slash member dash friend relationships w with many of you. I see Drew this morning. You know, we didn't say, uh, Shekinah glory, Shekinah glory, brother, say la. No, it was out the Bears, dude. Did you watch a game last night. What happened? It was blacked out, Cleveland versus the Bears. Keith Hoskins, they're from Cleveland. They love the Browns. I'm going to call him up today and spank that boy, you know, because he loves the Browns. Now, I'm not going to talk about church. I'm going to talk about you got your rear kicked in football. And uh, I like messing with him. And, and we didn't... That's called friendship. Okay, but I was his pastor for, for a long time. And his wife's pastor for since she was a little teenage little kid. And so we developed that relationship. And there's a certain relationship. My son-in-law, uh, Brother Dan, good guy. But um, I was his pastor for a while. And it's, you know, son-in-law, um, uh, you're his pastor, you're his friend. You crawl under a car with him. You, you, you move rocks with him. And you become yourself with people and you develop that relationship and and he becomes the pastor i i know this from he becomes the go-to guy you go to him with your problems you go to him with your questions um you get to know his wife and his family you learn the pastor's likes and dislikes and he learns yours or knows yours so what is that it's his personality and you say hey you know i i, I like our pastor he's a he's a pretty good guy i i, I like that guy well you know we called him to be our pastor. And, and as we do, uh, whether you like him or love him or whether you don't like him or don't love him, he's still your pastor. When we called him TRBC, it wasn't just, okay, this big group. Okay, like the other day, Ms. Jackson made hamburger uh, beans and she put refried beans in there. I just want a round hamburger. That's it. Just give me a round, big old fat hamburger, no bread, mustard, ketchup, dip it in there, potato chips, and that's all I wanted. Well, she, oh, she made hamburger goulash. It was, it was like glop. And I couldn't really taste the hamburger. And it's like, this is glop. You know, but I ate, well, you call, what word do you hate? Glort? Glop? Yeah. I didn't know that for, for a long time. There's certain words, he, a word he doesn't like. So I'm going to work that word and work that word and work that word. Uh, but um, she, she blended it all together. Well, when we called our pastor, it wasn't a call of glop. Okay, it was glop. Well, it wasn't glop. But we called our pastor, it, but you called him. He became your pastor. Not our, yeah, he's our pastor. He's the pastor, but he's your pastor. In fact, you should say this, he's my pastor. Now you're sitting there like, uh, like you're waiting for the sermon to start, but it already started. And so we got to get you involved in this. All right, so let's all say this together. Now don't say it before, look, you got to learn, learn me. Don't say it before I say it. I'll say, he, it, you start saying it with me. Okay, now, you're ahead of the curve. I can appreciate your intellect, but wait till I'm done. All right, number one, let's say this together. He, now, don't say it yet. We're going to say, he is the pastor. All right, let's say that. He is the pastor. Now, let's say, no, you got to say emphasis on the the, not he is the pastor. He is the pastor. He is the pastor. All right, let's try it again. Ready? He is the pastor. Now we're going to say R. He, not. 
You know what? You guys are on it. I don't think I need to say it first. All right, let's back up, and then we're going to walk right through it without. Okay, number one, he is the pastor. Ready? He is the pastor. Number two, our. He is our pastor. Number three, my. He is my pastor. Now say that again to yourself. Say it out loud. He is my pastor. This guy right there is our pastor, not my pastor. Well, he's my pastor. But I'm not the pastor. He's the pastor. Now, now, you know, I haven't needed him to, like, really be real pastoral yet. I don't go to him for a lot of counsel yet. But I know when I was sick, and I was sick for a long time, my son was all, our pastor was always there. When I was loaded into an ambulance, when Alicia, Miss Alicia and Addie saved my life from a seizure, from choking, and saved my life. I was on a Wednesday. I was, I was going to be in church, and I started having a seizure. I didn't know it. Woke up, and he, he loaded me into the ambulance. He came to the hospital. Uh, our pastor took me to the MRIs and x-rays. When my neck, you know, on 11-3-20, I had a neck surgery, and on 5-15-21, six months later, I had open-heart surgery. Okay, that's tough on the old body. I may, It might be better if I was in my 30s or 40s, but, man, when you're 63, it's tough to recover and get back. And uh, he was there every, every time. When I was at the house and I was, I, 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 my, my blood pressure was so low, I was on the ground. I couldn't get up. I was in my house. Uh, uh, had taken a shower. Um Modesty was out the door, and I could I we couldn't even get in the bathroom because I was on the floor. I couldn't I couldn't. He had to shove the door, shove the door, shove the door open just to get in to pick me up and drag me to a chair. That's pretty pastoral. Taking me to my MRIs, uh, hanging out, not hanging out as a pastor, but doing the things that are pastoral. Now, for me, he's always been there, and I think for you, he'll always be there too. I mean. The things I just described, that's pastoral, right? Uh, that's pretty, pretty doing the job, don't you think? And he was and he is somebody who's earning our trust and our confidence. We are told by Apostle Paul, follow him as he follows Christ. Now think of this. He has to know everything there is to know, I guess, about salvation, about baptism, about repentance, about imputation, about prophecy, principles, the child rearing, marital problems, soul winning. He's got to know why the King James Bible that he keeps talking about. Why does he know that's the Bible? He has to understand tithing and offering. He has to teach us on prayer. Man, you can do that for a year. Prayer, just prayer. He has to teach us how to forgive. Man, it's hard to forgive people sometimes. I just want to like crank their stinking tail. Forgive you? How about if I tune you up, bro? Forgive can't be that way. You gotta let the old Doug die. Amen. Let the old Doug get, get out the road. And our pastor has to teach us on forgiveness and the Trinity and creation and joy and peace. And he's gotta be sweet and nice, and his wife's gotta be nice, and the kids have to be good. Dag, who wants to be a preacher? Say, this won't help anybody, Pastor. It'll help us in our relationship. See, the purpose of a pastor is not to control the lives of the people, <clears throat> but to teach his people the word of God while leading us, leading them in serving God. He's to lead us, not control us. And that's what he wants. That's, that's, what, he, that's what he wants. The Bible has much more to say about pastoral responsibility than about pastoral authority. And people that want authority usually aren't qualified to be authority. It's people that say, I don't want the spotlight. I don't want to lead. I, not that I, it's just, I, I don't want that responsibility. Well, in the Lord's work, you don't get, a, you don't get to vote. Sorry, God, I, that's not what I'm going to do. God says, nope, I'm calling you to do that. And the Bible talks about many are called, but few are chosen. What's that mean? Uh, when I was at Hope Baptist Church years and years ago, when I was uh, uh, very first saved, first few years, um, there were 15 men in that church, 15 men and teenage boys who said they had been called to preach, who said, God has called me to preach the Bible. And they did different things around the church. Uh, I went out to the Indiana Boys School every week because that's where 
They needed me, and that's where I went. It worked out perfect for me. Indiana Boys School with kids from all over the state, not just like juvenile, but Indiana Boys School prison. I mean, I could preach. I could cuss. You should have heard some of them first sermons, man. You're at the boys' school. Guards got saved. People got saved. Kids, all you'd walk in, and there's like, pods they called them and there'd be 18 kids 18 kids 18 kids 8 to 10 kids and then work your way back up so you could have 60 to 70 kids at first you know 25 would show up and before we were I mean it didn't take but a month they were all on the bars in their wheelchairs some were handicapped listening to what the preaching and my father-in-law Bill Hudson a good man God bless him he he was from Kentucky everybody and my you know um uh, my, our music was formed, that type of music. And he played his guitar, and there was a guy, a guy named Doc Hurt, who was a pastor, Wilbur Hurt's oldest brother. And they would sing just, it'd be like just a couple of boys playing guitar, singing about Jesus. Amen. And when they were done, all I had was a Bible. I didn't have anything else. And an outline. What's an outline? I didn't know what outline was. And I would preach salvation. I would preach a changed life. I'd preach about my testimony. I'd tell them, you guys, man. And I'd begin to say just for a few minutes, if I talk for two or three minutes, most of you would say, I don't believe you did those things. I don't believe that happened to you. And then you'd be calling me a liar. Not only that, you'd say the man standing behind the pulpit tells lies to us about his testimony. I don't lie about it. If I say it happened, it happened. And if I say it happened at a certain speed, or a certain day or a certain day. I have a good memory, don't have a strong body, but I got a good mind. And my life has been like, whoa, you can't believe the life I've experienced. What's that, what's that add up to? Most people are like, whoa, really? 15 called, three chosen. When I was giving my testimony at the Indiana Boys School, man, I was nervous as all get out. Then we went to Chicago preaching on buses, and we were in some tough neighborhoods. And then uh, different, then California, and then here. But the man of God, you've got to, he's got to be a committed man. He's got to be a called man. And if he's called, he has to show his mettle, M-E-T-T-L-E, his grit in his life. God watches it says, I'm going to choose that man. He's called. Many are called. Not everybody gets chosen for service. He was called. No doubt. He's got to know a lot of stuff, doesn't he? He's got to be a lot of responsibilities, doesn't he? Now, the Bible says he watches for our souls. The Bible tells him to do that. The Bible tells the pastor, you are going to give an account for how you pastored. Not just you're going to give an account for your life. Like Jesse, you're going to give an account for your life. Uh, uh, Mark, uh, uh, Thomas, Come on. we're going to give an account for our lives. That's bad enough, man. My life? And it's not your sins. It's it, We're going to give an account. He has to, pastors have to give an account of how he pastors us. I can say wow, or I can say stink. Well, that's a rough call. Watches for our souls. He gives an account. 39 months ago, he took on, we asked him unanimously. We chose him. He's the pastor, our pastor, my pastor. And 39 months ago, he took the mantle, and every day forward, he will give an account of this church. He's called the under shepherd. He's called a watchman on the wall. Revelation 1.20 says he's an angel. God holds, a, Jesus holds our pastor in his hand. He's a messenger to the church. Our church needs a pastor, obviously. He's the man of God. Imagine if our man of God could pray 10 hours a week just for ministry what's in our walls. If he could study and prepare messages and Bible studies and different things just in our walls. If he could soul win 10 hours a week and then visit people, not just soul win, but visit people that are in the hospital or sick or at home or just need a visit. Imagine what we could have around here if we had a pastor that prayed 10 hours, studied 10 hours, studied and prepared, soul win 10 hours and visit 10 hours. It's a tough job for sure. That's why many are called. Try it. Life is your tryouts. I, I'm going to say this, and I mean it. Let's be careful not to waste his youth. 
Because if we're not careful, we're just gonna, we'll burn him out. And three, four, five years from now, he'll be burnt out. Burnt out. Because he burns the candle at both ends. Much like I did, which I was glad to do it. I took pride in the fact I could go all day. I could work and work and work and work and work. Get up the next morning, fresh as daisy, ready to roll. But it's hard to burn candle at both ends. It's hard to carry the responsibility. I remember when I was a kid, uh, laying on a bed with a little 10 inch black and white TV. I was 12 or 13. I watched Bill Walton and UCLA beat, I think Memphis for the national title in 19, I think 81. I mean, most people don't do, most kids don't do that, 12 year old kids, but I watched that black and white commercials and all. And then by, that was 71, by 81, I listened to every, this is 81 games, every single Indiana Pacer game on the radio. Isaiah Thomas and IU won the national championship in 1981. That's where we got the nickname for Jamal. We call him Zeke. He played guard. That was Isaiah Thomas' nickname. By the late 80s, man, I was, I was playing basketball every day. I mean, I worked a job. I had a construction job. Every day we went and played ball. It was have ball, will travel. Amen. Um, I got a job. I got a job from a guy. I got one of the greatest uh, uh, situations, uh, uh, bids I, I ever was able to put in and accepted because I had a basketball in the front seat of my van. I was sheetrocking the house at night, and a guy next door was building the house, and he saw the ball in the front seat. He's six foot four, played ball, came in our house, needed to drywall. Hey, yo, long story short, psh, great, just by having a basketball. I loved basketball. Uh, we played ball every day. It was like basketball fever. I remember... Uh, um, um, renting a hotel room, watching the Pacers and the and Chicago uh, Bulls at a at a seriously, I think we got fleas from that place. But um, <laughs> it, it was it was basketball. I loved basketball. I remember driving through a blizzard. Were you with us when we went and picked up Josh Miller and went? In, I mean, a blizzard <clears throat> in Mom's uh, red Jeep, in which I bought from some money I made on the stock market. I had some stocks, uh, cashed them in, bought this. Uh, uh, a Jeep for Mr. Gave her the money. It was like 17 grand. And that stock went all the way up like 90 grams worth, $90,000. I'm like, I'm in the money. And then it went, wham. It's called a penny stock. And if you know anything about stocks, you know enough to know you don't know enough about stocks. Uh, but I got Miss Jackson a red Jeep. And we drove through that blizzard just to play basketball. We love basketball. Love that stuff. And I was a, a, a pretty good player, uh, addicted to it. Love it. Well, it's no wonder, it's not, it's not surprising then, that our pastor loves basketball. Now, how can we help our pastor? Help us. Number one, <clears throat> support his program. Support his program. Uh, he wants to uh, do the parking lot. He wants to fix the steeple. He wanted to fix the roof, which is mostly done. That was his doing. Uh, he wants to build some walls here. He wants to clean debris out. He's so sick of it. I, he wants to barf uh, all the grass that grows up the cracks in the parking lot. I hate that grass. I hate that grass. I hope all that grass goes to hell. <laughs> we care. We walk down our sidewalk and all that grass growing up between the cracks. I hate it. Brother Jewel comes and, you know, he thinks he's doing a good job, but he's sort of... <laughs> Brother Jewel comes and pulls his gear in. Man, he whips it around. He's got this place looking good. Uh, but the site, Jake's got a program. It's called Make the Church Better. He wants to fix some water. He made me. I sent him to the store to get mud. Please go get mud at Lowe's. He comes back. They don't have the right mud. I'm like, bro, it's just mud. Slap it on the wall. Well, they didn't have what you told me. It's like, okay. You know, there's difference in mud. There's taping mud. That's the green bucket. And then there's a... Uh, Topping mud, that's the blue and white bucket. Anyway, one weighs 60 pounds, one weighs 40. So we'll get the lighter weight. Anyway, fix that stuff, he said, Jackson, to me. You know how to drywall. Stop talking about Ernesto. Ernesto will fix it. No, you fix it. You're the big drywall guy. And I'm retired. And so he wants it done. Hey, he started a school. We ought to support it. We ought to help kids go if they're sincere and they want to go. We ought to find a plan. I know Brother Kevin and Miss Kathy were trying to work on a plan to help a prospective student or a possible student. It still may work out, but it's TRBA. So, well, we don't have any kids to send there. Well, support a kid going there. But Sarah left a job with the state. Stop talking back there. Hey, turn around, stop talking. Bless God. Amen. I mean, all of you, talk again. 
So who are you talking to? You, if you're talking. Support his program. Hey, suppose the disciples, Jesus' program, uh, when he said, make the, make the people sit down. Oh, I don't like that plan. Make them sit down. We're going to feed them. I don't like that plan. That's not a good plan. You can't. The disciples couldn't. They didn't argue. Get out of the boat. Ah, well, most of them said, I don't like that plan. But one of them followed the plan. Uh, move the stone. They said, Lord, John 11, Lazarus is dead. Uh, Mary and Martha, Lord, if you would have come, our brother hadn't died. He said, it's, it, it's all good. Move the, roll the stone away. And they said, Lord, by this time he's dead. He stinks. I mean, you know, we tried to embalm him. They didn't embalm him. They just sort of put some ointments and oils and cloves and whatnot and spices to keep the body, body um, fresh as long as they could. He said, move the stone. They said, move the stone. He's dead. He stinks. And Lord said, Jesus said, Move the stone. And they did. They followed the Lord's unorthodox program. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. They said, why did he? He knew who was in there. Everybody gathered there knew who was in there. Why did he have to say, why did he say, Lazarus, come forth? Whoop! Because if the Lord Jesus said, come forth, every single born again child of God would come up out of the grave, Amen. would come out of the tomb, and he'd have a big old crown all around him. So he had to say, Lazarus, come forth. One day, he's going to say, Douglas, come forth. And Doug's going to get up out of the grave, unless I go in the rapture. I'm going to get up. And by, by the way, those that the dead in Christ rise first. So the dead are going to beat us into the air. Then we which are alive and remain shall uh, jo join forever be with the Lord. And so, so support the program even when you don't understand it. I remember we were running a bus route and we wanted to hit a goal and the goal, the top number had been 103 and I wanted to go for 150. So we had a guy named Daryl Moore. He was our vision leader. I got all my workers together. I said, every time you see, and he taught classes. I said, no matter what happens, I don't care. No matter what happens, you don't say one other word. You don't say, hello, brother Moore. You say 150. That's all you say all week. Uh, we were staying in the hallways. I mean, he'd walk down the hallway. 150, and of course, you know me, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to. 150, 150, 150. We said 150, 150, 150. We went out to uh, an amusement park, loaded up two buses. At the end, so we get there, we had already counted, damn, man, 147. Ah, oh, we worked and we prayed and what, the workers are going to be a little disappointed, but we broke the goal of 103. 147. So we went to recount, and my lady bus worker hadn't counted Doug or Addie or Ben or, or um, uh, who's the next one? Sarah? No, who's the next? Teresa. Yeah, Teresa, Ben. Well, she's not here, and I forgot about her. Teresa, Ben, Sarah. Sarah, and Jake. So those four, and Miss Addie and I. There's six plus 147, 153. Woo, baby! We hit our goal. Why? My workers, the workers, supported the program. Though it seemed unreasonable, how are we going to reach 150? The biggest goal ever was 103. We can't get 150. And I kind of was like, eh, maybe. 150, 150, 150, 150. And we prayed and we worked and God gave the victory. God gave the increase. So support the pastor's program. He carries a burden. I'm a like, oh, poor pastor. I've already told you. What the Bible says, seemeth it a small thing unto you. And that's why sometimes, and this is my family back here, my daughter and my two uh, uh, grand, grandchildren, I can say, stop talking. Why? Because there's love. And they say, what if they're a visitor? I'll tell them to stop talking too, please. What if they don't stop talking? Then I'm going to raise my voice. Alex said, what if somebody comes into church and they act all crazy? Because Crystal gives out the address all the time. <laughs> you, know what they, you know what they do? They go to Walmart or wherever they go, there's no telling. And they take tracks and they put them in, like clothes that aren't bought, they put them in like uh, suits, pockets, there's tracks everywhere. So they're like, oh, look at this nice, you know, look at this new shirt I bought for Johnny. And they take it home. What's that in the pocket? Is that the receipt? It's a track. How do you know who gets saved? We don't know. Um, Dan and Sarah, Dan was telling us yesterday, they'll go to Borders and they put tracks in all these Bibles, and they went around, I'm not going to tell you, but they went to a famous preacher. This guy's famous. He's on TV. He's a millionaire. He got a big smile. You know, big smile. That should tell you. Well, they all have big smiles. And um, they put a track in every, Dan did, a track in every one of this guy's books. Now, I don't know if anybody gets saved. I think it's 
to me it's hilarious, and it's, uh, it shows a strong desire just to follow the pastor's program. If you have to put tracks in your envelopes when you mail out your bill to NIPSCO or wherever, follow the program of getting people to say, hey, follow the program of at least, not least, of the major task of getting the gospel out. And the gospel tracks have the plan of salvation that people have never heard. The people we talked to yesterday, they'd never heard the plan of salvation. They had never heard it as clear as the Bible gave it to them. And Mike Halter, 38 years old, and um, uh, Daniel Sanchez, who's the bad guy, on, well, Daniel Sanchez, I, as soon as he said that name, Daniel Sanchez, I'm like, ah, Daniel Sanchez got born again yesterday. Why? By hearing the gospel. So follow the program of the pastor. Man, if the, if the, the pastor says, make the children sit down, make them sit down. If the, Jesus said, uh, uh, roll the stone back, then ro whether it sounds uh, um, uh, logical or not, support the program. Here's a plan I got. You, you're just going to blow your mind. I want to have a contest. And years ago, we did this with um, uh, Dave Baker in uh, Columbia, Tennessee. We smoked that dude, man. We demolished him. We crushed that boy. He's from the South. We're, I'm from the North. And we did that. You know, it was the South against the North and the Civil War still being fought. And we, the North against the South. And we smoked him. It was a baseball game, seven innings. First inning, salvations. Second inning, Bus attendance, third inning, baptisms. I, I don't know what it all was, but seven innings. I mean, I like, we won. I would like to do that again with um, Roanoke, Faith in Burn, Open Door in Warsaw, and New Heights, and get five of us in a contest. And I gear, now I don't know what it'll do to the other guys, but when I'm in a contest and there's competition, I always go the extra mile. I always go the extra door. I want to win. Now, in this case, you're not going to win anything. We're not going to win. The church that does the best or has the most points, they won't win. We'll all, five pastors, him and four others, if he does it, will understand who won, the Lord won. Amen. Who is on the Lord's side? Who will serve the king? Hey, uh, who will something, um, something others to him to bring? Yeah. Hey, that would be a great contest, don't you think? Not yet. No. We've got to build up the forces. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but one of these days. Now support his program. Support his preaching. Uh, how? Attend. Be here. Be faithful. Hey, nod your little head up and down. Let's all practice that. I, I, I let you take a break from, wait a minute. He is, wait a minute. He is, which is it? Let's see if you remember. He is the pastor he is our He is my pastor. Let's say that again. He is the pastor. He is our pastor. He is my pastor. When you can say that, he's my pastor, it, there's a relationship there that just you recognize that's the man of God. I, the Lord put this on my heart two, three, well, I've been working on it all week, off and on. I, I hadn't asked to preach, didn't want, kind of, I told Miss Jackson, Man, I'm not preaching much. When I get asked to preach, I get nervous. She's like, you get nervous? I'm like, man, I'm, this morning I was pacing the floor, nervous, nervous for this sermon. He said, you get nervous, preacher? When I feel like God wants me exactly to say something, I get a little nervous about making sure I get it right. Now, support his preaching. Be here. He's, our, he's the pastor, our pastor, my pastor. Now, let's all practice this. Let's say Amen. Now, don't shout it. If you shout it, Francisco, I'm going to come back and slap you. But I'll do it with love. I will say this. Ernesto knows how. I mean, not Ernesto. He doesn't know. But, uh, but Francisco, here you go. I, I, here's Francisco. Amen. You're like, whoa, preacher must have said something good. I mean, we had visitors. You had your... Uh, your uh, nieces and nephews sitting there, and for, for Francis kept shouting, hey, man. And I watched them because I was sitting in the back. They kept looking around like, whoa, who is this dude? What's going on here? And that's okay. You say, well, they were, you know, I don't know if they're coming back. Well, hey, they got saved, and if they come back, you, well, I don't know if they're coming back. Hey, 16 and 17-year-olds don't always come back. But when they get to be 27, 37, and their life's all pounded around in the mush, sometimes they come back to their home base. 
So support the program, no matter how dumb it is. I didn't mean that. <laughs> support the program. Number two, support is preaching. Attend, be here, be faithful. Uh, say amen. Let's practice that. Everybody say amen. Come on, we got to hurry. Everybody, amen. Uh, nod your head when he's preaching. Laugh. Bring your Bible. I always see Miss uh, Cindy in the back uh, with Steve, and they come in, Brother Steve, and they come in, they, and they always have a Bible with them, and they carry their Bible. So, so cry if it's participate. Support his preaching. You know, uh, Mrs. Brown on Facebook said, uh, I had to leave early. On Facebook, she said, I had to leave early because Jake can't land the plane. <laughs> ah! I mean, you talk about throwing him under the butt. It's one thing to say it when you're walking out. It's another thing to just go on Facebook and say, dude. And, and I, I was talking to him this week, and I said, I have one word for you. He's like, because often I don't get in his preaching. I really, I used to a little bit, but I don't. I said, um, when you say you're going to close... Close. I mean, last Sunday I told him I was getting ready to fall on the floor and have a seizure just to get out of church. <laughs> so, so support his preaching, even if it is boring. <laughs> even if sometimes it is long-winded and he can't land the plane. Brother Howes used to say, no notes. Don't take notes when I'm preaching. He said, I'm preaching to your heart, not your head. And then Bob Gray says, get your pen out, right? get your pen out, get your pen out. Brother Gray says when he preaches, notes, notes, notes. Brother Howe says, no notes, no notes, no notes. Me, it's up in the air. I think you should take notes. And even though Brother Howe said, don't take notes, it's like, Brother Howe, I'm going to take notes because I'm going to preach some of this stuff. <clears throat> support the program. Support the preaching. Support him in prayer. I you say, I wish our pastor preached better sermons. If you prayed for him more, he might. I, I, I wish, oh, I wasn't making fun of him. I was just saying my personal prayer request. So why does he let kids run around church and make a bunch of noise? Because I said it was okay about five years ago. Doug Jackson's always like, you don't run in the church. I never let my kids race around. I didn't let members' kids run around. I didn't have it. You're not going to run around. We have so many people here. Some kid's going to knock somebody down the stairs. He's going to slice his head open. He or she, no running around. Well, now we have kids like Hudson and Nelson. And I, I, they're, those kids are like, get out of bed and go, <gasps> like they're spring loaded and they just start in the morning. I went back to Doc Bohazi. I'm like, how many of you guys? He's like 14. And they're, they're all, hey, waving at me. And he just, he looked at me. I'm like, he's like, and he pointed at Nelson and Hudson. They're like two amigos, noisy, crazy. Why is he let his kids run around? Because I love hearing kids run around in church. I love it. Where else run around? The playground? Great idea. The parking lot? That's okay. But run around in the church building and hide and seek and little kids having fun. And yeah, somebody's going to get their finger slammed in the door. Somebody's going to get hurt. Hey, it's the nature of the beast. I wish he wouldn't let his kids run around. Why? Well, I'm glad he does, and you are too. And if you say that, I'm, I, you should pray for yourself. You say... Man, I wish he wouldn't wear such flashy suits. Okay, today it's calm. But usually he's Mr. Flash and Dash. I think our preacher should not dress so, you know, uh, not flash. shouldn't dress so well. I think he should dress as well as he can afford. <laughs> Support the pastor in prayer. I don't think he should do that. Well, then why don't you pray about it before you speak to it? I mean, I'm going to say this real nicely. Shut your fat mouth. If you want to talk about the pastor, go talk in the bath. Miss Jackson, I've been memorizing a verse. Uh, uh, Sarah, you'll help me. Philippians 4, 7. Now, here's how I memorize. I've got the last part. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. And the last part, one is, what sort of things are of, what sort of things are true? What sort of things are honest? What sort of, what sort of things are lovely? What sort of things are pure? What sort of things are just? It, what sort of things are of a good report? If there be any virtue or any praise, think on these things. And that's right in the chapter where Paul's talking about peace and whatnot. It, good reports. I don't hear bad reports all the time. He hears enough bad reports. I want to be a good report person. I want to talk good. I want to act good. I, I'm, work, I'm not working on slang. Anytime I want, I can turn off the slang. Slang to me, I grew up with it. I say man, I say cool, I say bro, I say dude. I'm going to keep talking that way but I don't need to do that in the pulpit. And it's not something I have to try to do. It's just something I'm doing, something he's doing. He set an example. He said something one time. He said, why would I let something go 
or give it away that God gave to me. Man, I wish I'd heard that 30 years ago. I truly wish I'd heard that 30. I'd still have 70 Nova, and I'd still live at 1025 Elmwood. Uh, but I didn't hear that. I wished I had. You can always learn from Pat. I'm 30 years his senior. I mean, when he was born, I don't know, I was 30, I guess, 30-something, 29. He, you say, well, he's your son. You know, you, I don't treat him like my son unless we're in son-father situation. But most of the time, he's the boss hoss. Support his program. Support his preaching. How? By saying amen, by shaking your head up and down. By Number three, support him in prayer. We should, we should uh, pray when souls. We should pray as joy and peace and his needs are met. Number four, quickly, lastly, tell him you believe God will use him. You walk out that door today, if you don't do it, I'm going to stand there about two steps away. I'm going to listen. And you women, you, can, you don't have to. Every one of you men ought to say, hey, man, I believe in you. Tell him that today. You say, well, does he need that? I have no idea. I, I don't know if I ever needed it. People would say, I believe in you, preacher. Here's what I would say. Good, because I believe in me too. I never need anybody to believe in me. Well, we believe in you, and you can do it. Yeah, uh -huh. I know I can do it. Why? Because I know I can do it. I don't need encouragement. I'm not a guy that says, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. I'm not that kind of guy. I'm the kind of guy that says, you can't do that. Okay, it's on. Support his program. Support his preaching. Support him in prayer. Lift him up. Lift his hands up, the Bible says. Uh, when the hands get heavy, lift them up. Tell him you believe God will use him. Understand he's a watchman on the wall. Say, say to him, I do believe that. Tell him, text him, call him, write him a note or a letter. Surprise him with a just because note. Doesn't have to have a check in it. Casey Brandon has written Miss Jackson and I some notes. Uh, very, very gracious lady. Doc Harriton, uh, earlier years ago, when she would uh, come to our house for a holiday, she would always write us a, a, a note to her host, which was us. Even though we were family, friends, slash, she still had Mrs. Carter, had her daughters do it, Lydia and Claudia. It's passe now. Nobody writes notes. Everybody's handwriting's nil. They don't teach it in schools as far as I know. But I write letters. I, I love the letters I have from my father, from my mother, things that are important to me. Take care of your pastor. Tell him God will use him. When I pastored TRBC, I had so much encouragement and so much cooperation, and we had unity and Christian unity in the local New Testament church. That's what we need at TRBC. We need a pastor, a man of God, who has the time to pray, to study, to visit, to soul winning. Oh, let's not forget he has to work a job. Oh, yeah, he's got five kids and a wife. More than funds, he needs prayer. He needs you to believe in him and have confidence in him and lift him up in prayer. Would you bow your head, close your eyes, Miss Jennifer?